Hello, and welcome to this introductory course for Amazon Web Services. The purpose of this course is to provide a high level introduction to Amazon Web Services using oversimplification of concepts for the purpose of providing a frame of reference for you to move forward. What I mean by this is that this course is not going to teach you specifically how to use any specific AWS services and it is not going to get into any technical definitions or explanations. What we're going to do here is again just to provide a high level introduction and I'm going to do that by really oversimplifying a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about just so that you can have a frame of reference to move on with. And now moving on whether that is to AWS certification courses or on to other cloud or DevOps type courses. Or if you don't work in the IT field, maybe you're on the business side and you just kind of want to get a sense of what AWS is or what cloud is in general, this is a great course to start with. So first let's talk about the cloud. Now many of you are probably somewhat familiar with these icons, right? You see them a lot these days. Maybe you see them on your phone, maybe you see them on your desktop, and you hear terms like iCloud or Dropbox, or you hear sales pitches, which is something like store your files in the cloud. But then that really begs the question, right? What is the cloud? I talk to a lot of different people and there seems to be a lot of confusion about what exactly the cloud is. Some people think that if they upload their pictures, their files to the cloud, that it's literally just kind of floating around out there in cyberspace. For the purposes of this course, and again, this is an extremely oversimplification of this concept, and I'm going to repeat that a lot because I just want that point to be extremely clear. But when you think about the cloud, right, I want you to think about it really as just a computer, just like a computer that you have on your desktop um, or your phone. It's just a computer that's somewhere else, right? And I know that may seem kind of odd or, you know, again, an extremely oversimplification, but if you don't know what the cloud is or have no real conceptual understanding of what it is, just think about it in that terms first, okay? It's a computer that is somewhere else that you are in some way utilizing, whether you're utilizing its storage or its processing power, you're utilizing that computer that is somewhere else in some fashion, obviously using an internet connection. Now in reality, it's not just one single computer, it's more of something like this, a data center, which you may have seen pictures of in the past where there's just rows and rows and rows of server computers that you are utilizing. So when you think of companies like iCloud, Dropbox, or Amazon Web Services, your files or your pictures, or your documents, whatever you're storing are not just going up into the cloud into this magical mystery box. Your files are actually being stored on a server computer, which is in one of these racks, as they're called, in one of these data centers, which now there are many of all around the world. So Amazon Web Services, or AWS, is a cloud services provider and that is also known as Infrastructure as a Service, or IAAS. Commonly, people refer to cloud server providers, they think about storage, computing power, databases, but something like Amazon Web Services offers a lot more in terms of networking, analytics, developer tools, virtualization, security. Now, you're not gonna have to know or understand what all of these terms are, but I just want you to get the picture that Whereas you may have used something like iCloud or Dropbox in the past to store pictures, videos, some documents that you may have, that is only a very small subset of what cloud computing is. And the list that I have in front of you here, while certainly not all encompassing, is a much broader list of things that cloud service providers provide. So why do individuals and companies use AWS? What are the benefits? How is the cloud different from what has been used in the past? So let's discuss that now. For some common personal uses of cloud services, so think about iCloud, Dropbox, or AWS to a certain extent, here you are on your home computer. Now you may use iCloud or Dropbox to store videos, pictures, or some personal files that you may have. And 
what cloud allows you to do specifically for an individual is backups and sharing. So you use iCloud or Dropbox as an additional backup for the pictures that you have from vacations or some documents that you have or music or videos that you want to save. And on your home computer, on your home hard drive, there's always the risk that your hard drive will fail. So you use the cloud for backup. So there's always another copy. The cloud is also great for sharing. And I don't necessarily mean that in terms of sharing your files or your pictures with other people, but sharing it across devices. So you can access the same files on your mobile device, or if you're at work from your work computer, and it just means that your files will be available anywhere that you go and you can access them from any different type of device. So with that, I want to introduce two pieces of cloud terminology. Number one, which we'll call high availability and number two, which is fault tolerant. Now, when I talk about high availability, again, this is an oversimplification of what high availability is, but just think of it like this. If you put a file up into the cloud, you can access it from any type of device or any type of computer, as long as it has an internet connection. So that makes that file highly available. You can access it from anywhere. Also, when you think about fault tolerant, there's several different ways that you can use the term fault tolerant. Here, I just want you to think about that if you have a file only on your home computer and your home hard drive fails, then it's gone. So the system that was in place did not account for that fault being the fault of your hard drive. But if the file is up in the cloud and it's backed up on multiple services, then that file can become corrupt or the cloud server that it is currently stored on can fail. And there will always be another copy for you to access. So if there's a fault in the system, you will still always have the ability to retrieve that file. So the terms high availability and fault tolerant really go hand in hand, meaning that your files are always available across multiple devices. And if there's faults in the system, wherever that may take place, you will still be able to access your files because there's backups and other ways to access it. So again, high availability and fault tolerant are two terms that we need to know as we start to learn about AWS and cloud computing in general. So now let's talk about some common enterprise uses of cloud service. So here's an example of a company, we're just calling this software company. And if this company is not using cloud services, that means that they're currently using on-premise servers to run their company, meaning that they have server computers, which are you know storing their data, handling their code, or when customers use their software, they're accessing the software on the company's servers. Now, in this example, let's say that it is 2016 and this company currently has about a thousand users which takes three servers to power the software for those 1000 users. So now let's say we're looking forward to 2017 and this company is estimating that in 2017, they're going to have growth and they're going to have 5,000 users. Now, if they're going to have 5,000 users, the three servers that they originally had would not be enough. So they're going to add an additional three servers to handle the load of having more users. But in order to add three additional servers to their on-premise data center, they're going to have to one, have the size and the space to put these servers into their data center. They're also then going to have to research what type of servers they need. They're going to have to buy them. That's gonna cost generally a significant amount of money. They're gonna to have to wait for delivery, which can be anywhere between a week to several weeks for servers. They're then going to have to set them up test them, install operating systems, software, get them all up and running. That can take a lot of time. So let's assume that their estimates were right. And in 2017, they increased their user base to about 5,000 users. And the six servers are currently working for them in the user base that they have. Now let's look forward to 2018. And let's say that they're now expecting 20,000 users are estimating 20,000 users in 2018 as their company and user base is growing. So now they would have to add an additional 12 servers. And again, now they must make sure that they have the space in their data center. They would also now need to spend the money for these servers. Again, go through the process of ordering, waiting for them to come, installation. But one of the major problems here is that they may have now spent tens of thousands of dollars on these high-end servers 
But what if in 2018 they were wrong and they didn't get 20,000 users, but they only topped out at 7,000 users? So now a whole segment of the servers that they just purchased for 2018 aren't being used. So it was a tremendous waste of resources, a tremendous waste of money for something that is not being used. And now they would have to sell the servers or just let them sit there until the user base were to increase. But for a company, specifically a growing company, spending the tens of thousands of dollars on these servers may have been a big investment. And if they didn't get the user base to back that up, it could be a major loss for the company. This is a problem with on-premise data centers that something like cloud services seeks to solve. So now let's take a look at the same scenario, but if the company is using a cloud service provider such as AWS. So in 2016, again, this company currently has 1,000 users, and let's say for this example that they have two servers that they currently have provisioned and are using in the cloud. As the company grows, at this time, I'm not even going to put a timetable on it because the timetable doesn't matter anymore because the company no longer has to project or estimate future growth. Naturally, as the user base increases, say from 1,000 to 4,000, cloud service providers, and again, this is an extreme oversimplification of this concept, but cloud service providers, as user base grows, can automatically and instantly add additional servers. So the company didn't have to estimate growth, make sure that they have room on their on-premise data center, spend the time and research to figure out what kind of servers they need to buy, order them, wait a few weeks for delivery, install them, install operating systems, test them, load their software onto it. Literally within minutes, using a cloud service provider like AWS, they could immediately have two new servers up and running with their software installed. And that can be done at any time. So a process that used to take several weeks can now be done in a matter of minutes using a cloud service provider like AWS. So now let's continue this and look at an example where maybe the user base was at 4,000, but now dropped to 3,000. Now, if you notice here, as it dropped, one of the servers is now gone. Because what happened here is that when you use cloud service providers, especially when you're using servers, you're only using them when you need them. So the second the user base dropped from 4,000 to 3,000, the cloud service provider simply just decommissioned that server, and this particular company is no longer being charged for it. So unlike in the on-premise example, when they had to buy physical hardware, install it in their office, and then if it wasn't used, they still were stuck paying for that hardware, using a cloud service provider, you're only leasing hardware on, on an on-demand basis, meaning that as your user base grows, you can add more, and as it shrinks, you can pare those down and no longer pay for them. So that's going to introduce two more pieces of cloud terminology called scalability and elasticity. So this is, again, two other major reasons, especially why enterprise companies use cloud services. So when I talk about scalability, what I mean is that as user base grows, you have the ability to quickly and easily add more servers. So you can scale up extremely easily. Now, elasticity means that you can grow, but you can also shrink. So as you go from 1,000 users to 4,000, you can grow, but as you drop down to 3,000 users, then you can pull back in, you can shrink that down. So think about elasticity, right, a rubber band. So that's what I want you to think about when you think about scalability and elasticity, the ability to quickly and easily grow and shrink on demand as needed. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Again, we talked about the cloud and what the cloud is. And again, what I want you to think about when you think about the cloud is just a computer somewhere else that you are using in some fashion. And AWS is a cloud services provider. We then have our four cloud terms that I introduced during this video, which are high availability. When you think of high availability, just think about your files are available all the time and from any device that you want. With fault tolerant, think about that if something were to go wrong, a hard drive were to crash, a computer were to go down, that there's backup. That no matter what goes wrong, you'll still be able to access your files and your files will never be deleted. For scalability and elasticity, again, just think about the ability to quickly grow and shrink on demand 
based on your needs. So the four terms listed here are the major reasons and advantages why both personal users and enterprise users love cloud services. So what's next? What's going to follow in the next few videos of this course? And this is what's going to follow. Now, if you were to right now Google AWS architecture, you're going to see a ton of diagrams that look like this, albeit probably a lot more complicated than this. But this right here is a very simple diagram of AWS architecture. And we're going to walk through some of these services in the next few videos, again, on a very high level. And I'm going to oversimplify a lot of these. But it's going to give you a great frame of reference to understand what these services and what these concepts are going forward. So we're going to take a look at VPC, at Amazon S3, Amazon EC2, and Amazon RDS. And we're going to talk about how these all work. And we're going to relate these concepts by talking about Facebook and Netflix. Now, Facebook is going to be used as an analogy to describe VPCs. And then we're actually going to talk about Netflix because Netflix is actually the number one Amazon Web Services user. And we're going to talk about how Netflix uses these services so that you can understand the basics of why a major company like Netflix uses these services. And hopefully this will allow for a very understandable way to understand these concepts. Okay, so that will conclude this video. I look forward to seeing all of you in the rest of this course. Thank you for watching. You may now move on.